Trustee Ed Center. And I would like to welcome you to our March Educational Seminar today. Um, we are going to start with a couple of housekeeping uh, comments. So your phone lines are muted. Um, if you have a question to ask when we get to the questions, you can unmute by hitting pound six and then mute back again to star six. Uh, you can also ask questions through the chat box. We will have the recording and the slides available after the webinar today. Um, and we do have a feedback form, and we certainly appreciate all of your comments and suggestions. So if you could take just a few seconds at the end to do that, we would really appreciate it. So the topic for today is, kidney, is sepsis and kidney disease. And we are so pleased to be co-sponsoring this program with the Sepsis Alliance. This is the largest sepsis agent advocacy agency um, in the United States. Their vision is a world in which no one is harmed by sepsis. Today's program fits with their mission of raising awareness of sepsis as a medical emergency. It's been my pleasure to work primarily with their staff member, Sarah McManus, to make this webinar a reality. And again, I thank them, and I am so happy that we have made this program a reality for today. We have two speakers, and I'd like to just take a moment to introduce them, and they'll tell you more about themselves as we move on. Our first um, speaker will be Sharon Hansen, and they'll be both speaking throughout the program. But Sharon is a critical care nurse. She's um, been doing this since 1986 in the Tacoma, Washington area. She's been a critical care nurse educator for the past 10 years. She's a part-time lecturer for the University of Washington Tacoma School of Nursing and a clinical instructor for Green River Community College. Karen is all too familiar with sepsis in both her personal and professional life. Her husband, Mark, developed sepsis in 2003 and experienced post-sepsis syndrome symptoms. Her clinical focus centers on sepsis identification, early and effective resuscitation, hemodynamics, oxygenation, optimizing hemodynamic support, and post-sepsis syndrome. Our other speaker today, who I'm very happy is with us to share her experience, is Stacy Slater. Stacy is a mom, a paralegal, and a sepsis survivor. She's also a person living with kidney disease. I suspect she will always remember October 2012, and I'm sure you will hear more about that year as she shares her story later in the program with us. I'd like to ask you to please hold your questions for our speakers until the end of the program. Um, at that point, you can unmute your phone. But I'd also like to ask if you have questions during the presentation, welcome to put them in the chat box, and we'll get to them at the end of the program. If for some reason we don't get to all the questions, we will um, get them answered and then send them out to you after the program is over. At this point, I'd like to turn the program over to Sharon and Stacy. So for the purpose of this discussion, we're going to uh, use chronic kidney disease as kidney disease um, that does not require renal replacement therapy, such as dialysis or transplant. And end-stage renal disease is stage 5 chronic kidney disease. And those will be individuals requiring maintenance dialysis, such as hemodialysis or peritoneal dialysis. Let's go to the next slide. So we'd like to find out some of your experience. Have you had your had sepsis yourself, or have you had a friend or family member with sepsis? If you can please respond, we'll take a moment and see what's coming up. So it looks like on on this poll we've had about six individuals who've had sepsis themselves. Um, and those who've had a family member with sepsis looking at about 18 or 45 percent. And, and that's something I want you to keep in mind is this is not just um, being aware of sepsis for yourself, but um, really looking at how can you help educate others 
with what the signs and symptoms of sepsis are. Okay, next slide. So conditions of kidney disease, um, what can cause that? Um, we'll see that with high blood pressure, also known as hypertension, diabetes, chronic glomerular disease, congenital abnormalities such as polycystic kidney disease, medullary sponge kidney. Um, you will also see kidney disease come from actual kidney damage. And sepsis is the most common cause of acute kidney injury in the intensive care unit. But we'll also see it come from shock and toxins. Let's go to the next slide. The risk of acute kidney injury caused by sepsis um, really depends on how do we manage it. And, and this is the really uh, important thing I want you to take away is if you can identify sepsis early, we can help prevent seeing individuals go into acute kidney injury. But if you look at the left side of, of the screen, you can see nephrotoxic drugs or drugs that damage the kidney, um, often older age, um, people who have lower filtration rates by the kidneys, diabetes, high blood pressure. Um, there may be instance of cardiac failure, chronic liver disease. And then you can see some elevated markers that we, we see for the kidney um, to look at who's going into kidney failure. So all of those become risk factors for uh, clinical acute kidney injury. So now if they prevent with sepsis and we are able to treat early and use renal protection as far as looking at how are we dosing medications um, and our selection medications, that we, we do careful volume management or fluid management and really help support the blood pressure, we can prevent that individual from going into acute kidney injury. But if there's a delay in treatment of sepsis, and this is where it's really important that if you're having signs and symptoms of sepsis, that you're calling attention to it and being seen. Because if it's, there's a delay, if the medications being used are nephrotoxic, if we allow the patient to remain with a low blood pressure or low cardiac output, or we don't volume load them enough, we can see these individuals go into acute kidney injury. Let's go to our next slide. So I want you to hear from Stacy. And, and Stacy, can you tell us your story of being diagnosed with, um, with a chronic kidney disease? Yes. Um, so ever since I was 14 years old, I would get kidney stones. The older that I got, the worse it got. Um, for the most part, doctors would just tell me that I was a stone maker and then I would have surgeries, which included lithotripsies or uteroscopies where they go in and they pull the stone out and then they place stents in. So by the time I moved from Arkansas to Georgia and then to Colorado, because we're a military family, um, I was looking for a doctor to help me with this issue and to possibly put a name to it. I went to the first doctor who didn't even come in and look at me, he sent a, an APN in, and uh, also with the um, prescription for pain meds. I tore the prescription up, I said I need help and I left the office, I found another doctor. And with me, I have to be very proactive in my care because I've, we've moved, of course. So I keep a book of medical records and um, things that I've, you know, surgeries that I've had done. So when I went to see this particular doctor, I wanted to hand him this book. I shoved it at him. And he's like, oh, wait, just, just give me a second. Let me look at your, your x-rays and let's see what, you know, what, what we're dealing with. He took one look at my x-ray and he said, it's clear you have medullary sponge kidney disease. So I felt a little better because I had a name to it. But at that time as well, I was very, very sick when I arrived in Colorado. So we ended up setting up a surgery to remove stones that were blocking. And this is where my experience with sepsis came in. Okay, thank you. And let's go to the next slide. And I want to just call out a couple of things that Stacy mentioned. And, and really, 
she was incredibly proactive. She knew something was wrong. She knew she had repeated stones, and so she kept records. And as she was going from physician to physician because of her movement, she was able to bring her records with. And, and I want to encourage you that you've got the voice to say something is wrong. I need you to listen. And I want you to remember you're the person who knows yourself the best. And I, you know, I loved hearing what she said. She found a good urologist who listened to me and my concerns. And I don't know how many are on this. I I'm actually have a room of nurses that are, are listening in on this. But really, the importance of, of as healthcare providers listening to what our patients are saying, and, and for those who are having concerns, the not being afraid to speak up and, and say, there is something wrong. I need you to listen. Let's go to the next slide. So chronic kidney disease. What are risk factors for infection with that? Well, often there's coexisting conditions, such as diabetes, such as cardiovascular disease. Um, we'll often see these individuals struggle with nutrition, and they may be malnourished and have low albumin levels. They may be on immunosuppressive therapy. Uh, they may have what's called nephrotic syndrome, where protein leaks into the urine. Uh, uremia, which is a buildup build up of urea in the bloodstream, or anemia being low blood count and low oxygen carrying capacity. They may, like what Stacy was pointing out, struggle with obstructions secondary to something like stones. Um, and then there's also the challenge of multiple medical devices and procedures that will put a person at risk for sepsis. Let's go to the next slide. So with acute and end-stage disease, there's the risk factors for infection as well. And you know, individuals receiving dialysis have risk factors related to the dialysis access. Uh, they may have a temporary catheter that goes into a large blood vessel. Um, they may have an AV fistula or a graft or a peritoneal catheter. And it, it's just paramount that every time you are accessing this, whether you're doing it yourself or you have a healthcare person doing this for you, that you pay strict attention to um, maintaining sterility of that site when you're getting ready to access. Um, looking at the dialysis procedure, that anything that is entering your body um, is, is sterile, is, has been kept as, as appropriate to do that. Um, when somebody is accessing the site, that you are being careful not to have anybody breathing on it, that you're wearing a mask, you're wearing your, uh, your gloves to protect. Um, but also be aware that being in end-stage or acute renal disease actually is a state of immunodeficiency itself. And experience with sepsis back in 2003, um, and he currently is um, in the hospital again with sepsis. And and just yesterday, seeing him get ready to go back into the OR, and and watching his vital signs, and and watching his lab work, and realizing, wow, he has such a huge risk for this overwhelming response. It's, it's really your body being overactive and having a toxic response to an infection. And that infection doesn't necessarily need to be in your bloodstream. And you know, I want to reiterate that. You may have an infection um, that's originated from, um, say, oral work, dental work. Uh, you may have, if you've got diabetes, you've got a sore that won't heal, and you've got a, an infection um, elsewhere that um, you still are at risk of sepsis, even though that infection may not have entered your bloodstream. Let's go to the next slide. 
So the incidence of sepsis is huge, where we see you know, globally 8 million people die of sepsis every year. Let's go to the next slide. And sepsis contributes to one in every two to three deaths in the hospital. And the majority of people have sepsis, who, who die of sepsis, have sepsis on presentation to the hospital. So be thinking about how you can be an advocate and get yourself to, um, to the hospital early as opposed to late. Let's go to the next slide. And the deaths from sepsis outnumber the deaths from breast cancer, AIDS, and prostate cancer combined. And, and that, to me, is staggering. Let's go to the next slide. So what are symptoms of sepsis? What should you be looking for? Sepsis Alliance has this mnemonic where S stands for shivering, fever, or very cold, D e for extreme pain or general discomfort, P for pale or discolored skin, F for sleepy, difficult to rouse, confused, I, I feel like I might die, and F again for shortness of breath. And, and honestly, that feeling that I might die is one of the things that we hear over and over again. And when you have these symptoms, you know, urging you to call 911, go to the hospital, say the phrase, I'm concerned about sepsis. Let's go to the next slide. So kidney conditions themselves create challenges in recognizing sepsis. And we may not be able to see the symptoms um, that we're used to seeing on presentation. And this may be due to medications the patient's on, like if they're on certain blood pressure medications or heart medications, their heart rate may not go up. And so if, if healthcare providers are looking for you to have this elevated heart rate, you may not show it. Um, you may have that decreased immune response. And so we typically are looking for elevated white blood cell counts, but you may not generate that elevated white blood count. Another thing is if you are chronically hypertensive, you may drop your blood pressure, but not to the, the level that we're typically looking for in identifying sepsis. And this is what happened to my husband a couple of weeks ago, was he chronically is hypertensive, he became septic, his blood pressure didn't get down to 100 or to 90, and so they weren't paying vigilant attention to that. And, and so having to call out this is relative drop in blood pressure compared to what is normal is. And again, reminding you, you need to be your advocate. Um, it may be that it's just hard to differentiate. Is this due to my chronic condition or is this due to an infection, what I'm feeling and what I'm seeing? I want you to take a moment and think about what are some factors that might make sepsis recognition difficult for yourself. And let's go to the next slide. So, Stacy, you had mentioned that you had a procedure that then led to sepsis. Can you talk to us about your experience? Sure. Sure. One second. Am I echoing? I know some people lost audio and jumped back on, so make sure that you meet your computer speakers. OK, let's check it again. OK, can you hear me clear now? <laughs> You're good. Okay. Um, so on October the 30th, um, I went in for a regular, I call it a regular routine because I've had it so many times, um, for them to go in and take the kidney stones out, put the stents in. You know, after about a week, I'd go back in, get the stents taken out, and then I'm fine. However, the next morning um, when I, I awoke, I was in so much pain. I've never felt that much pain before. Um, I was really cold, and the house was warm. So it was in in Colorado. Of course, we know it snows, but it felt like someone had actually just put me outside naked. 
So my husband, I asked him to, you know, run me a hot tub of water and sit me in the water, but it didn't work. He tried everything from taking me out of the water to putting me in front of the fireplace. I was just cold. Nothing was helping. Um, I wanted to rest, and for the most part, he pays attention to me. And if it wouldn't have been for him being there, someone else probably would have just let me rest for hours, and I wouldn't be here. Um, after I sat in front of the, hot, the fireplace for a while, uh, my temperature started to go up as he was, would check my temperature. Um, all I wanted to do was lay down. I didn't want to get up. I just wanted to just lay down. That's, uh, that was the only thing that I thought that would help the pain that I was having and how dizzy I felt. Um, but he wouldn't let me sleep. For, he let me sleep for just a little bit, but he wouldn't let me sleep longer um, than like a couple of that, like an hour or two. But when I did wake up, I threw up, and that's how he knew, um, no, this is not right. You're going to the hospital. So I got dressed. I uh, arrived in ER. They took my blood pressure. My blood pressure, according to my records, um, was 108 over 62. I had a physician see me about mm, 25 minutes after arrival, and by 1240, my blood pressure was 80 over 50. And then three minutes after that, it was 76 over 48. And at that time, they started to administer um, IV fluids, two bags, actually. Um, then my blood pressure went up just a little bit to 94 over 52. They administered more bags of fluid, and I plummeted to 86 over 50. And they continued to give me ba bags of fluid, but they also, um, I didn't get, from the time I arrived for, at 10.55 a.m., I didn't get any antibiotics until 3.45, which is a long time to get antibiotics. And then I was admitted into the hospital, uh, and the thing was to keep me stable um, the doctor was going to put me on pressors if my blood pressure did not go back to a somewhat normal rate. Um, I just remember the doctor telling a joke. I laughed, and he came back in and checked me later, and my blood pressure did go up. Um, the whole experience of being in that hospital was very different from my regular stays. I felt horrible the whole time I was there just in and out of it, the pain was horrible. But one of the first things I noticed in my record is that they said that I didn't look good. You know, they said that I looked sick. And the hospital that I attended is one of the usual hospitals that I had been to a couple of times, and I ended up seeing some of the same nurses. And my nurse was the one that was like, eh, something's not right. You know, this doesn't seem normal. And she was able to get to the doctors, and uh, I got admitted. I stayed for seven days, and I got better. However, um, after leaving the hospital, um, there was no literature about sepsis. As a matter of fact, in 66 pages of my records, they never mentioned it. But I was septic because the uh, infectious control doctor, um, we spoke about it. And I went home, and I thought I was normal, and I wasn't. So um, we'll, we will definitely get into the after sepsis experience. But this is, this is my experience and what happened to me October 31st of 2012. Thank you. Thank you, Stacey. And let's, let's go to the next slide. And you know, some of the things that Stacy talked about is time being very critical. And you know, she talked about how difficult it was even at, at home, just kind of trying to sort through, okay, I feel cold, what's going on, I feel chilled, it's snowy up, maybe that's why I feel chilled, just trying to follow through this. 
and but then it was her family member identifying, yeah, with her, this is something not wrong, not right. We're gonna have to take you and and get you seen. And really, you know, the other thing with what Stacy was saying is nowhere in her hospital record did they really talk about sepsis. And I, I want to empower you, I want to empower the healthcare workers um, to be saying the word sepsis, that you, if you suspect sepsis, that you actually say the word sepsis. Um, the importance is getting um, blood cultures early and timely. Um, early antibiotics, she mentioned there was a delay in antibiotic therapy. And every hour that we delay antibiotic therapy increases mortality by 10%. So really be thinking about what can you do to advocate for yourself. Um, fluid administration, we heard through Stacy's um, narrative about they had to keep giving her fluid. And, and we may hear people say, well, she's got chronic kidney conditions. You know, do we really want to do that? Well, this is the other thing to call out is if you have somebody, you know, you're going in for a procedure related to a kidney stone, a lot of times just disrupting that will create kind of a septic storm um, as, as they get those stones dislodged. So be aware of that. Um, it is important to give enough fluid, but not too much fluid. And so really do uh, that fine balance. And then removing the source or any possible source of infection. I want you to keep in mind that sepsis is a medical emergency. And if you suspect it, to call 911 or get to a hospital right away. Let's go to the next slide. So again, suspect sepsis, say sepsis, be your advocate, advocate for your advocate for your family. One of the things that Stacy had mentioned, all I wanted to do was lay down, but before I could lay down, I threw up, took more pain medicines, took a nap. After about two hours of napping, I could barely hold my head up. I was very confused in pain. I had a headache. My temperature had gone up to almost 102. As I sat up catching my bearing, I threw up again, but this time I knew something was very wrong. And it's that sense of something is very wrong that I want you to listen to and get assistance. All right, let's go to the next slide. So how do we prevent sepsis and really prevent infection. So if, if we prevent infection, we can prevent sepsis. Um, stellar high hand hygiene, excellent oral care, and story after story after story of individuals who have either poor dentation or good dentation and they go in for an oral procedure um, or maybe they have a cut in their mouth um, and all of a sudden they have sepsis. Um, you know, just be very uh, vigilant in, in your oral care. Um, you are the owner of your dialysis access sites and make sure anybody accessing it is scrubbing the hub. Um, partner with your health team regarding those lines. Um, also be aware that if you, um, you may have an indwelling urinary catheter place, but if you're not having urine output, um, that sets up for a um, huge risk for an infection there. So it may not be necessary to have that catheter in, and if it's not necessary, it should be removed. Um, stay up to date on your vaccination. Um, really talk to your family and friends about infection prevention, about um, getting vaccinated. vaccinated. And, and another challenge that some of our, our patients with um, chronic and acute kidney injury have is um, difficulty with nutrition, and you've really got to optimize your nutrition. Let's go to the next slide. So the great unknown, and, and Stacy had started to allude to you know, her after sepsis. Um, we don't know really what sepsis survivors go through, the number of disabilities. You know, some are really obvious. We'll see an amputation. But others are going to be less obvious, um, thinking challenges, memory, inability to do calculations, um, post-traumatic stress disorder. And many will carry the scars of sepsis for the rest of their lives. Let's go to the next slide. 
So this is a um, word cloud that I had reached out to a number of sepsis survivors and asked for them to give me what words describe sepsis for them. And one individual um, not only gave me some words, but wrote a, um, a, a really, it, it just was a, a stunning um, presentation of her experience with sepsis. And I'd, I'd like to share that with you. And, and this is from Dana. And she's an RN who's also a sepsis survivor. I've been thinking about this for a month. As I was in the hospital for two plus months and hospitalized more times than I can count, I remember lying there waiting to hear the word discharge. Little did I know that with discharge comes a whole new battle to fight. Discharge starts the new journey where your family is now disappointed that you're not capable of doing the things you used to do. Discovery that you will now face post-sepsis syndrome, something no one warns or educates you about. Dismissal from the medical professions that, professionals that have no knowledge of post-sepsis syndrome. Disfigurement, whether it be externally or internally. Disability that doesn't cover half of what it takes to survive. Disorientation from the memory loss you now must face. Disorders of your now newly changed body and mind. Discounting people that have no idea what we face every single day. Discarding of a spouse that can't handle your post-sepsis you. Diseases that you now have to figure out how to live with. Discrediting of the battles we face just to make it through each day. Disgust with the changes in your body that you cannot fix. Dismay that you have over realizing you thought the battle had been won and then finding out it's only just begun. Distrust in the medical professionals that fail to listen to you when you know more than they do about your unique experience and aftermath post-sepsis. Disbelief from every person around you that thinks you're just seeking drugs, attention, and excuses. Disemployment from a career you worked so hard at and loved. It's that time of discharge that starts a full-blown grieving process that you must walk through in letting go of the person you once were in discovering your new normal that you must now find. Discharge should come with a huge warning sign to let you know that as you walk out of the hospital or wheeled out, you are leaving behind the person you were admitted with forever because sepsis has now ruined that person. You're now faced with the insurmountable challenges that you have to navigate through all alone because no one around you has any idea just how changed you became in the days, weeks, months, or years to come. So Stacey, what, what was your experience post-sepsis? My experience post-sepsis, being a student in a master's program, was very difficult. I had to take time off. It's, if you've ever had a time where you couldn't spell like a simple word, like it, I know we've all had these fogs, but this fog is a continuance daily. The fear of going back in the hospital, in which I have been septic more than once, um, just not being able to do some of the things that I used to do, like running, um, shopping for long hours with my friends, just playing around. Now I'm, I'm tired most of the time. Um, my body aches and it hurts a lot. Um, nobody understands the depression that you have or the anxiety that you have about getting, you know, being septic and having to go through this process all over again. Um, people are used to me being a real happy-go-lucky person, but they don't see the other side of me being worried and, and me being depressed that I'm not myself anymore. Um, Nobody really talks about post-sepsis syndrome. Um, I had one doctor mention it, um, but that's about it. And I'm still on the journey to find someone that can diagnose and treat me for any of the post-sepsis syndromes that I have. Um, but being proactive in your care is the most important thing. It's your body. You take control of it. 
And if you don't feel right or if you have some of these symptoms, tell your doctor. And if your doctor can't, you know, help you with that, find someone else that will. Yeah. And and honestly, um, that's been our journey with, with my husband. And, uh, you know, it, it's, it's hard, it's so hard on the set the survivor, but it's it's also takes a huge toll on the families. And and so let's go to the next slide. So really how can we avoid post justice syndrome is that early identification and and being vigilant that we look at how do we prevent sepsis that we raise awareness, that we empower um, ourselves and our family members to speak up for themselves, and we treat sepsis as what it truly is, as, as an emergency. Let's go to the next slide. So Sepsis Alliance, and um, this is an organization that I, I just so fully support. As, as far as what they continually do to make um, materials available to both healthcare professionals and to individuals and their family members with sepsis. Um, looking at, at this screen, you can see there's, there's just so many information guides, and they're, they're making more and more and more as we go along. Uh, there's sepsis symptom cards. There's um, additional resources such as videos um, or like what we're doing today, um, a webinar. Um, one recent story I have is, um, you know, some of my Facebook friends say I just kind of assault everybody with sepsis, but I, I keep reposting things from Sepsis Alliance or interesting things. And, and I received a um, message from a friend um, from a, a childhood friend, and her father was my godfather. And she's not a healthcare provider at all, um, but she would read my posts. And her father became septic, and because of what she had read, based on what I had put on Facebook, she was able to identify and get him into the emergency department. And so what could have been um, catastrophic he was discharged a few days later and having no symptoms and, and no problems. And, and so I would say use your voice to advocate um, what you're learning and, and communicate with friends and, and families as well. Let's go to the next slide. So Sepsis Alliance has, you can access and, and follow some of their feeds on Facebook, on Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram. Um, another great resource is just going online and signing up for um, their newsletter at sepsis.org. Let's go to the next slide. And I am going to turn this back over to our host, and then we will um, shortly open this up for questions. All right. Thank you, Sharon. Um, First, I'd like to thank both Sharon and Stacy for their um, outstanding wisdom and, and giving us a great presentation today. It's been truly um, enlightening for me, and I thank both of you and Sepsis Alliance for working with us to make this happen. Um, just one quick thing before we open it up for questions is that um, next month our educational webinar will be um, on nutrition, a livable, lovable approach to kidney disease nutrition, where we'll look at CKD issues as well as how to slow the progression of kidney disease and how nutrition can help prevent some complications. So please go to our website and sign up for that. At this point, um, if you have questions, you can unmute your phone um, by pound six and ask a question or put a question in the chat.
I think early on in the presentation, someone had um, asked about sepsis prevention in exercise facilities or what resources were available for those facilities. Is that something you can touch on? So as, as far as for within exercise facilities, um, what can we do for um, sepsis uh, education? Is that what I'm understanding? I think so, or maybe just being aware in that public space as well. Um, it was kind of vague in the chat, so I'm sort of extrapolating. <laughs> okay. So, you know, come, some of those things, um, having, if, if you're seeing individuals, maybe you're doing an exercise facility where um, you're kind of doing cardiac rehab, um, maybe you're working with um, individuals who have suffered chronic disease, having information such as the um, information guides from Sepsis Alliance available. The other thing um, I would do is having uh, a hand sanitizer, having masks, having those signs about covering your cough. If you feel ill, um, please wait to come until you, um, you feel better. You know, some of those things to be proactive. And and we've got a question from my room, but I'm going to have you walk up here so everybody can hear your question. I won't tell her this is national, will I? <laughs> OK. So you just talk. This is Michelle, and she's one of our nurses. Well, I heard in one of the slides earlier you were talking about optimized nutrition, and I wasn't quite sure what type of diet or something they put someone on such as like low sodium, high protein, what really works? Okay, that's, that's a great question. Thank you, Michelle. So really looking at um, working with our, both our nursing staff, the patients, and, and our nutrition folks, um, one of the challenges with acute and with renal failure is, is balancing the protein intake and, and really seeing how well an individual is clearing the protein. Um, but a lot of times, they're really not getting adequate protein. Um, and, and looking at some of the things as well, um, as we, we think about some of the nutrients like um, our vitamin Bs and our vitamin Cs, um, and just the great effect that those have on you know the antioxidant properties. Um, and, and so really looking at what can, can we do as, as we're working with individuals coming into the hospital, what sounds good, what can you eat, looking at um, their nutritional related labs, um, looking at getting dietary consults sooner than later. Um, and in the outpatient setting and, and for individuals with, with chronic kidney disease and with um, end-stage renal disease, really being proactive at looking at your nutritional status. Um, I have a, a, a dear friend who is awaiting transplant, and he had to, um, you know, there was a challenge with some, some weight management, so he went in for some bariatric surgery before he could be considered um, a candidate for that renal transplant. So, you know, really tapping into your resources that you, that you have around. Okay. Are there any other questions? Um, Krista posted in the chat, she wanted to know if you'd seen research confirming sepsis occurrences um, being higher with HD permanent catheters versus other hemodialysis accesses. So, so my understanding um, is that with the fistula, you'll you'll see less risk of sepsis than with the catheter. But um, but that's just from a, a bit of what I have read. Um, and I would certainly encourage you to talk with your um, nephrology um, and dialysis centers to see what, what they are seeing. But that, that is my understanding um, related to the fistula. And, and the beauty of the fistula is you don't have a catheter that is, in a sense, a foreign body. Um, 
And for us in the hospital, if we have somebody with a um, access, um, whether it's a tunneled or um, non-tunnel catheter, we're going to use what's called the biopass well net to help try and decrease um, uh, it as a portal for infection. And I'm just reading G uh, Gina. Is it Gina's statement? Um, I'm just going to read it out loud because, Gina, you kind of hit what I felt like when, when my husband um, had septic shock. And what she said was, my daughter, when she was four years old, was in severe sepsis. This was back in the late 90s. Even though I'm a critical care nurse, I was pretty clueless. Her experiences fueled my love for sepsis education. Graduate pro project was an online class for one of the schools of nurses in my area. It's called Taking the Scary Out of Sepsis. Um, and, and indeed, you know, in the late 90s was really when our understanding of sepsis, um, really the first guidelines were coming out in, in 2000. And we didn't understand what sepsis was. And, and the other thing interesting to keep in mind is that pediatrics um, present much different and need to be managed much differently than adults with sepsis. Thank so you. Is there anything else? Uh, this is Kathy. I have a another question. I, some of the things that I've seen or, or read where, so we talked today about somebody being able to say, I, you know, I might have sepsis or they want to be checked for it. What can people do if the staff sort of ignores that question or, or they say, yeah, yeah, well, we're going to look at things? Do you have some thoughts on what people can do to advocate for themselves if it seems that some of the staff is not listening to what they're saying? Absolutely. And honestly, that was my case a few weeks ago with my husband. Um, to say I was not quiet would be an understatement. Okay. Um, it's that it, and, and what we see a lot of times, and, and we'll see it in the media, is, oh, they have an infection. There's this reluctance to actually call something sepsis. And, and what I did, you know, as a nurse was say, I see this SERS criteria, that SERS criteria, plus he has an infection, that equals sepsis, and I need you to get somebody here now. And there was still a bit of reluctance. And then, and then things got moving. And if things weren't moving, what I would have done is called a rapid response. So if you are in a hospital setting and you are not seeing that your loved one is getting the care they need, you have the authority um, to activate a rapid response for your loved one. And if you feel like you're not being heard, I just say take it up the chain of command. You, you, know, you talk to the provider. You talk to the medical director. You talk to the manager of the department. You talk to the chief nursing officer. Um, but don't just take no for an answer. Um, I can say with my experience, um, I attend the same hospital. And my doctors, my urologist is actually at this hospital. Um, so when I go in for new, pe new doctors that I see in the ER, I always let them know, hey, I have been septic before, and I am concerned about this if I have an infection. Usually, because I'm at the same hospital, I don't, have, I don't wor worry about that because they, they are usually good about checking it. Uh, I haven't, I've never fell into that um, that realm. So the only way I can answer that from a patient standpoint is to just, you know, visit the, uh, one particular hospital regularly where the nurses and doctors will know you or where your doctor in particular is um, stationed or is able to do rounds. And uh, just let them know what you're concerned about.
Okay, thank you for that wisdom. Um, are there any other questions? This is Christy. I just thought of something thinking about Stacy's story. Once you, are, once you become septic once, are you more prone to have septic incidences or does it depend on the person? Well, for me in particular with um, the kidney stone disease that I have, um, I have a lot of stones and I also have a lot of scar tissue set up from a lot of the surgeries that I've had. So for me, I have a large reoccurrence of, of um, getting being septic again. Um, that's why I'm so careful about you know staying in one hospital, staying where my doctor is, calling my doctor. My doctor is really good about calling me back personally, um, and not everybody gets that. But yeah, for me, I'm at risk a lot because I have stents that are placed in my kidneys. I actually have a stent right now, and um, so I'm I'm at risk a lot. And, and that is something we see with sepsis survivors is they are more prone to sepsis. Um, and, and if you think about sepsis affecting the immune disorder or, or altering your immune system um, and setting individuals up for recurrent sepsis, and, and actually readmission to the hospital within um, 90 days is fairly high for survivors of sepsis. Um, you know, and, and the, where a lot of research is being done right now is looking at is there a genetic makeup that certain individuals are going to be more susceptible to sepsis than others. And so you know, there's a lot right now being done to, to look at why one individual can be exposed to the same bacteria and do just fine and a, another one becomes septic or, or another pathogen. It doesn't just have to be bacteria. Okay, thank you for that. There's a, a lot of information to think about. Um, and it's good to hear that research is still going on. And we, learn, we will be learning more and more about what's going on. Um, any last questions? All right, well, once again, thank, I want to thank all of you who participated on the call, who joined us, um, as well as those who shared with us. And again, a special thanks to Stacey and Sharon, and to Sepsis Alliance. And we will be sending um, the recording, the slides and the recording will also be available on our website. So everyone will have the information and can listen to it again and share it with others. Thank you again for your attendance today. All right, thank you. Thank you, guys. Mm -hmm. yeah, thank you again. Bye-bye. <laughs>